This is lecture four of wireless communications at Chalmers University of Technology. My name is Henk Wemiesch. Today we will cover part of chapter three of the book Wireless Communication by Andrea Goldschmidt. In particular, we will deal with white band models and the white stand stationary uncorrelated scattering assumption. We will introduce the concepts of coherence bandwidth, delay spread, coherence time, and Doppler spread. At the end of the lecture, you should be able to explain the difference between those four concepts. The difference is between narrow band, wide band communication, slow fading, and fast fading. You should be able to compute the 2D autocorrelation function of white stand stationary uncorrelated scattering processes and quantify the four main properties of channels from those 2D autocorrelation functions and their transforms. Finally, you should be able to design communication systems in a way that they are narrow band or wide band or operating under slow or fast fading. Recall from last time that we considered channels between a transmitter and a receiver with multiple paths. When the receiver had a large bandwidth, we could resolve all of these paths in the delay domain, and we would see something as shown here on the, in the middle. When the receiver has a small bandwidth over the same channel, we would see everything lumped together, and this would be a narrow band communication. In addition, the signal varies over time due to mobility. Mobility is modeled due to a statistical distribution and an autocorrelation function. The distributions we've seen are Rayleigh and Ryson distributions. These are distributions of the envelope of the channel. And we've also seen a specific autocorrelation function, namely Jake's model, which relates to the coherence time or how long the channel remains approximately constant. From two lectures ago, we remember the difference between the physical channel and how we communicate over this channel. The physical channel, as you noted, C of tau and T, has certain properties, including the delay spread and the coherence bandwidth. The delay spread is the time between the first and last reflection, or the first arriving path and the last arriving path. The coherence bandwidth is the inverse of the delay spread. The coherence time is the time for which the channel is approximately constant, and the inverse of that is the Doppler spread, the rate at which the channel changes. When we communicate over this channel, we as engineers have to choose a certain communication bandwidth or its reciprocal a certain symbol slot duration. Based on how we make these choices, the communication can be narrow band, wide band, slow or fast fading. In particular, for a given channel and a certain choice of bandwidth, when the symbol slot duration is much larger than the delay spread, that means we have narrow band communication because from the point of view of the receiver, all the paths appear as one. If the symbol slot is on the same order or less than the delay spread, we have wideband communication because there will be inter-symbol interference. This is also called frequency selective or dispersive communication. Then the choice of the symbol slot duration with respect to the coherence time leads to slow fading when the symbol slot duration is much, much less than the coherence time. This means that for many symbols, we will see the same channel or approximately the same channel. If the symbol slot duration is on the order of the coherence time, we have fast fading because different symbols will see different channels and the, the channel can change almost symbol by symbol. Last time we talked about narrow band communication. Today we will talk about wide band communication, both slow and fast fading. We also recall the extreme cases from last time. So this here shows the channel as a function of delay and time for a wideband slowly fading communication. This here shows the channel as a function of delay and time for narrowband fast fading communication, which is what we studied last time, where the channel was basically a complex number that varied over time. And this complex number had a statistical distribution and it had a certain autocorrelation function. Today, we focus on the more general and more complicated case. Let's go back to this fundamental model that we've seen before where we have a transmitted signal U of T, which arrives at the receiver via a number of paths and each path has a delay, an amplitude, a phase rotation, and then in total there is also noise. We can pull out the carrier, and then we get the second expression, where what is highlighted in green is the complex baseband received signal. We can then de determine a baseband convolution of the input signal and a time-varying channel. If we describe the time-varying channel here as a superposition of delta functions with delays 
amplitudes and rotations. We can then show when we substitute this expression here in this integral, we find what is highlighted in the green box. So C of tau and T is the underlying time varying channel. When we had narrow band fading models, these delays were not resolvable, they just appeared as a single delay and the channel then was just a complex number that varied over time. This channel was then characterized by a distribution, which was really Orisian fading, those are the ones that we've seen, and also the variation over time, or the autocorrelation function through Jake's spectrum, that tells you how quickly this C of T changes with respect to time. And this was reliant on the white stand stationary assumption. In wideband fading models, we still have to use both t and tau. So there again, there are two notions of time, delay and time. Since the two notions of time may be confusing, it is good to go again over convolution. This animation shows here an incoming signal, which is the time reverse of the real input signal u of t, with a channel here c of tau, and then the convolution will be a triangular shape, which is just the yellow area as it changes over time. Okay, so the output signal is the convolution of the channel with the input signal. In the frequency domain, we can take the Fourier transform of the output signal, channel and input, and we obtain this relation. So the convolution in time domain becomes a product in the frequency domain, where this is just a standard Fourier transform. When we have a time varying convolution, the filter changes over time. So then the channel will look something like this, which is exactly the channel that we have here in our wireless communication system. Then we can no longer apply this trick of writing the Fourier transform of the output as the product of two Fourier transforms of the channel and the input, because the channel itself varies over time. We can, however, define a time varying Fourier transform of the channel by taking the channel at a certain time and computing its Fourier transform. As a special case, we can consider the input to be a tone, so at a certain frequency, then the output will just be the same tone times the Fourier transform of the channel evaluated at that tone at that time t. We also recall from last lecture that it was useful to introduce a, comment, a, a notion of white stand stationarity. A white stand stationary random signal is a signal for which the first and second moment do not vary in time. Of the three figures here shown on the top, we see that the first and second are not, cannot be white stand stationary because the mean in the first one does not stay constant with time. For the second one, the variance does not stay constant with time. Well, for the last one, both mean and variance appear to remain constant with time, so this could be a candidate for a white stand stationary signal. In particular, the autocorrelation function does not depend on time. So the autocorrelation function of a white stand stationary process, defined as the expectation of the signal or the process multiplied by the process a little bit later, only depends on how much that little bit is. It does not depend on the time at which we consider. On the bottom here, we show two autocorrelation functions, in red for a slow varying process, and in blue for a very quickly varying process, corresponding to the figures on the left. This is all for a one-dimensional signal. Let's now consider what happens to the autocorrelation function for two-dimensional signals, such as our channels. Then, the autocorrelation function is in general a four-dimensional object, taking as inputs two delays and two times because the autocorrelation function is defined as the expectation of the channel, complex conjugate, at delay tau 1 and time t, multiply with the channel at delay tau 2 and time t plus delta t. So there are in principle four arguments. We would like to work with more simple models that only depends on two of those arguments. So first of all, we would only like to depend on delta t, not t, just as in the narrow band fading channels. So the, the time t at which we look at the autocorrelation function should not matter. Secondly, we would like the autocorrelation function to be such that it only depends on tau. This means that two channels corresponding to different delays, tau 1 and tau 2, are always uncorrelated. 
So we can only look at a certain delay. So let's look at this in terms of a picture. This figure shows as a function of delay tau and time t, the channel. What we like of this channel, what we would like of this channel to be is that for any two time, any sorry, any two delays tau, let's say tau one and tau two, the channel is uncorrelated. So the value for any time here corresponding to tau one and tau two, these are two uncorrelated random variables. What we would also like is that the channel remains correlated over time, but that this correlation only depends on the delta t. It does not depend on when we draw those three lines, only the difference in time between those lines. It then follows, of course, that if we look at the channel at a certain time t and a certain delay here, corresponding to another channel with a other time and other delay, that these, of course, must be uncorrelated. This is what we like our channel model to be, so how do we make sure that this happens? In order to get to the desired autocorrelation function, we will need to make several assumptions. First of all, we will ignore path loss and shadowing and focus on only non-line of sight communication, basically a really fading scenario. In that case, the channel will be a two-dimensional complex Gaussian process. Such a process is characterized by a mean function, an autocorrelation function, and a cross-correlation function between the in-phase and quadrature components of the channel. We will assume that the phases of the multipath components are uniform and independent, and then this implies that the mean is zero and the cross-correlation is also zero. Hence, the channel is fully described by the autocorrelation function shown here. Now, we make two additional assumptions. First of all, we make the wide stand stationarity assumption, just as in the narrow band case, that the autocorrelation function does not depend on t, only on delta t. So it does not matter when we look at the autocorrelation function, or function only at the time difference between the times that we look. Secondly, we also make the uncorrelated scattering assumption, which says that there is no correlation for different delays. So the channel for a certain delay and a different delay will always be uncorrelated. So when tau1 here is different from tau2, the autocorrelation function is zero. We only need to consider the case where tau1 is equal to tau2, and we just call this tau. With this more compact autocorrelation function that only depends on two arguments, a delay and a time difference, we can then determine the four important quantities of the channel. The RMS delay spread, or the delay spread, the coherence bandwidth, the Doppler spread, and the coherence time. We've seen this informally before, now we go into more detail. One way to obtain or to simulate a channel that satisfies the wide sense stationary uncorrelated scattering assumption is the tap delay line model. In the tap delay line model, we consider m time varying taps, these are complex numbers, spaced delta apart in the delay domain. So we have different taps spaced delta apart in the delay domain, where delta should be sufficiently small with respect to one over the bandwidth. The total delay spread, of course, should then be less or equal than m times delta to ensure that your simulation captures the entire delay spread of the channel. Each tap with index m is an independent random process. These processes are independent because of the uncorrelated scattering assumption. For a given value of tau, the average power can be derived from the autocorrelation function evaluated at time difference zero. This is also called the power delay profile. This tells us how the power is spread across the delay domain. This is typically something exponentially decaying. For a given tau then, how the channel varies over time is just from the autocorrelation function. And this is basically the same as in the narrow band fading. The statistics of each of the tabs then can be Rayleigh, Raisya, Nakagami, or any kind of fading distribution. So in more detail, how could we simulate a really fading channel? We could do the following. We choose a certain bandwidth, a certain delay spread, certain uh, receive power. We then choose L channel taps spaced one over two B apart, where then the total number of channel taps should be sh uh, long enough to capture the entire delay spread of the channel. Then for each path, we choose a certain variance. So each path will be a Gaussian process with a certain variance. These variants should be chosen according to the power delay profile and a typical way is to do something exponential. So this is an exponentially decaying power for the different paths, corresponding to different delays. Where, of course, the total power of all the paths should be the total received power. 
Then for each path, so this is a tap, we generate a complex Gaussian random variable with the correct power. To model the time evolution for each of the paths, we use the autocorrelation function. And this we do by filtering these Gaussian random variables, which we can generate as white with a proper filter to have the correct autocorrelation function. We can do the same for a Ryschen fading by just adding a constant to the first step and redistributing the energy depending on the k factor. We can derive several interesting properties from this autocorrelation function. Let's look at a simple example. We know that the channel for two delays is always uncorrelated. What about the channel for two frequencies? So let's consider the Fourier transform of the channel at a certain time t. And let's look at two different frequencies, f1 and f2. What can we say about the correlation of those channels at those two frequencies? So how quickly does the channel at a certain time vary in the frequency domain? So let's proceed. We can Evaluate the expectation of the channel in the frequency domain at time t, at frequencies f1 and f2 here. We just plug in what does it mean to have the frequency transform of the channel. So then we have the original channel in the delay domain with time, the notion of the frequency transform, and the d tau 1, d tau 2 for the first and second part. We can then pull out the integration out of the expectation operator. We also can pull out these exponentials because there's nothing random there. So in the end we just have this expectation here. Now we know that when tau1 is different from tau2 this expectation is zero so we only need to consider tau1 equal to tau2. So now only a single integration is left over tau1 is equal to tau2 and then here also in these exponentials tau1 is equal to tau2 and we only have one d tau. Of course, this object here is just an autocorrelation function at delay tau for a time difference of zero, because you have t and t here. This is this guy. And now this then again, we can see as a Fourier transform, so we can write this as a with subscript big C, because we work in the frequency domain, for a frequency difference of delta f, where delta f is just a difference between f1 and f2. So if I were to visualize this, this is the channel in function of frequency and time. So for a certain time, the channel changes over frequency. This would be one column of this uh, color map. And this autocorrelation function tells us how quickly the channel varies over the frequency. This is only one example, but we can of course take many different kinds of transformations. So we start from our original autocorrelation function, and then we can take a Fourier transform with respect to tau, which will lead us to this autocorrelation function which depends on the difference between two frequencies and the difference between two times. We can also, starting from the original autocorrelation function, take a Fourier transform with respect to delta t, and then we end up here with a Fourier, with an autocorrelation function depending on tau and a frequency parameter uh, rho. Finally, we can take a two-dimensional transform with respect to tau and delta t to end up with this um, function here, which depends on delta f and rho, which we can obtain also by going on the left path down or the right path down. Now this may seem a little bit abstract, so we can make things now a little bit more specific. Let's start with our original autocorrelation function and let's let delta, D, delta t go to zero. Then we obtain a function ac of tau, which basically tells us how the energy is distributed in the delay domain. This is called the power delay profile which allows us to read off the delay spread relatively easy. There's a typical figure of how the power delay profile looks like as a function of delay. We see that the power delay profile in principle goes down slowly, but from this we can determine different notions of delay spread. So it's a little bit small, but you can see her mean delay spread or RMS delay spread. So most of the energy of the channel lies within the first part of the channel. This first part of the channel, the extent of this is the delay spread. Now let's look at this autocorrelation function. With arguments delta f, the difference between two frequencies, and delta t, the difference between two times. This autocorrelation function would look something as shown here on the left bottom. So we see the two axes, delta f and delta t. If we now let delta f be zero, now we just cut across delta t, 
we see a function which basically looks like the autocorrelation function we've seen in narrow band fading. So this was the autocorrelation function associated with the Jake's spectrum. On the other hand, when we let delta t go to zero and we focus just on this slice as a function of delta f, we see to what extent different frequencies are correlated. So this was the example we did in a few slides ago. From this figure, we can then read off the coherence bandwidth. So when the autocorrelation function is relatively small, that tells us something up to that point is the coherence bandwidth. By letting delta f go to zero, looking at the zero crossings across the delta t axis, we can read off the coherence time, just as we did in the narrow band fading case. We can now, of course, take the Fourier transform of this function, and this leads us to the um, Doppler power spectrum, just as in the narrow band fading case. From this one, we can, of course, read off the Doppler spread. So when this function becomes approximately zero, that is the Doppler spread. The Doppler, power, the Doppler power spectrum can also be obtained through the function sc of delta f and rho by letting delta f go to zero. Finally, we have the scattering function, which has arguments t and rho. We recall rho is obtained by taking the Fourier transform of the original autocorrelation function with respect to delta t. So rho is expressed in hertz. Looking a little bit closely at this function, when we fix tau to some value, let's say zero, and we cut across here, we basically recover our Jake's spectrum. So this was the power spectral density for Rayleigh fading that we've seen in the narrowband fading lecture. When on the other hand, we cut across the delay domain, we see how energy is distributed across the delay, similar to the power delay profile. To understand the relation between the four main concepts and the autocorrelation function in more detail, we look at the following figures. So here on the top left, I show the power delay profile as a function of the delay. This function goes to zero slowly, but we can still say when this function is sufficiently small, we say this is the delay spread. And in principle, we can interpret this power delay profile as a normalized function, so it becomes a density, and then we can have a rigorous definition for this delay spread, such as the RMS delay spread or the mean delay spread. So this function tells us how quickly the channel decays in the function of the delay domain. We also know that if this delay spread is um, small with respect to the symbol slot, then we have no intersymbol interference or narrow band fading. When this delay spread is large with respect to the symbol slot, then we will have wide band fading or intersymbol interference. If we take the Fourier transform, we find this autocorrelation function. This tells you to what extent two frequencies are correlated. So this function I will try to draw here in red. So when this function goes approximately to zero, we could declare this crossing of almost zero to be the coherence bandwidth. The coherence bandwidth is approximately one over the delay spread. The delay spread is expressed in second, coherence bandwidth in hertz. The coherence bandwidth tells us how two different frequencies are correlated. Now, when we communicate over this channel and we choose a small communication bandwidth, like here, then we will have narrow band fading. This means that all the frequencies over which you communicate will see approximately the same channel. This means the channel will appear flat from the point of view of the communication. When over this channel we use a large bandwidth, so this is corresponding to this, then different communication frequencies will see different channels because the channel has changed over this whole wide frequency band and we have wide band communication or frequency selective communication. So these are two ways of saying the same thing. Similarly, we have two ways of talking about slow and fast fading. So we have the autocorrelation function AC of delta t, which was the same one that we had in the narrow band fading case. When this function is close to zero, we say this is TC, the coherence time. And again, we should be careful in this notion of coherence time. After a time tc, the channel has decorrelated or has become independent in the Gaussian case. So the channel is approximately constant for a very small fraction of tc, let's say 10%. We can take the Fourier transform of this autocorrelation function. We obtain uh, the Doppler power spectrum. 
from which we read the zero crossings, which are the Doppler spread. And approximately uh, the inverse of the Doppler spread gives us the coherence time. We will have slow fading when the symbol slot is much less than the coherence time. This means that many symbols see the same channel. We have fast fading when the symbol slot is on the order of the coherence time, which means that approximately each symbol sees a different channel. So this is the end of the lecture. We have seen how to describe the difference between delay spread, coherence time, Doppler spread and coherence bandwidth, between narrow band and wide band communication and between slow and fast fading. We've computed 2D autocorrelation functions of wide stand stationary uncorrelated scattering processes. We've quantified the four main properties of communication from this autocorrelation function and its transforms. And we've designed communications systems in order to be able to be narrowband or wideband or slow or fast fading.